Okay, welcome back. It's our great pleasure to welcome Yuji Tachikawa and to listen to his first lecture on topological phases and relativistic quantum field theories. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Nobody said yes, but I guess <laughs> I guess assume you can hear it. Um, so uh, the topic of my talk is about the interaction between um, HEPTH and CONMAT, I mean theoretical side of CONMAT, and the I mean interaction between the two subjects is a long-standing source of good intuition for both sides. Everybody knows that the idea of the Higgs mechanism came from superconductivity. And uh, more recently, um, many people in this room have heard about something called ADS, contest matter physics. And also, um, theoretical study of topological quantum field theories in three dimensions is very much the same as the studies of anions on the condensed matter physicist side. So uh, there has been a constant influx of ideas on both sides. But the today's topic, I mean the topic of this week's uh, lecture I'm going to give is the relation between the anomalies on one side and uh, something called a symmetry protected topological phases. on the other side. Uh, this is often shortened into just SPT phases. What are they? So that's the topic of my talk. So I will keep the answer to the rest of the talks. But uh, let me briefly uh, explain to you the history of the interaction between the two. Um, so in high energy physics side, everybody these days now learns about the basics of uh, perturbative anomalies, one loop anomalies, etc., in your textbooks, right? So it's very familiar for us, at least for continuous symmetry. So familiar for us when G is continuous. So the story goes back to the 80s, I mean the early part of 80s. But uh, I wonder how many of you have wondered what will be the anomalies for, say, finite groups. So this is unfamiliar for most of us. At least it was unfamiliar for me until a few years ago. But I should say that the study of anomalies of finite groups in the HEP TH side is also a uh, old subject. Um, so there's one important paper by Digraph and Witten. from uh, 1990. But this paper has not been used very much on the HEPTH side. And suddenly, around 2010, uh, condensed matter physics physicists, uh, including Wen and Kitaev, realized the physical significance of their constructions. So these condensed matter physicists realized the importance of th uh, these anomaly of the finite groups and the associated SPT phases, which I'm going to explain. And even later, starting around, I mean, 2013 or 2015, we've been re-importing the developments on the condensed matter physics side to the high energy physics side. So we've seen various works by Kapustin and Zyberg, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for example, one of the applications of this influx of new ideas from the contest matter side is uh, recent. So about exactly one year ago, uh, there was a nice paper by uh, 
nice paper by um, Gaiotto, Kapustin, Komargotsky, uh, Zyber. So in, in this work, they used the ideas introduced in the condensed matter side to study the property. They studied the phases, phase structure of finite temperature, non-supersymmetric and mills. Um, so uh, I didn't think that we could say anything about um, non-supersymmetric Young Mills with finite temperature in a, I mean, completely, I mean, without non-numerical methods. And uh, so, so but, but they extracted various interesting physics using this idea applied to high energy physics systems. So, I, so the last aim of my talk is to explain what they got. But uh, at the same time, um, these new ideas imported from the condensed matter physics side allows, uh, allows you to understand in a new light Uh, various constructions, strange constructions in string theory, in perturbative string theory, per perturbative for example, um, so people in the string theory community are recently learn in recent years I think learned string theory by reading Polchinski's textbooks and uh, you will find many constructions like GSO projections and uh, I mean orbifolds or antifolds and the constructions are rather tricky, right? I mean, the idea might be simple, but actual implementations of these procedures requires the careful treatment of various signs. And it's not, it was not clear to me, at least, when I read the textbooks, the standard textbooks, why those signs are necessary and why some of the uh, operations are possible in a certain uh, world sheet theory and some of them are not possible. Uh, these things, can be clearly understood by placing the, these uh, constructions of the world sheet two dimensional theories in the language of more modern understanding of uh, relationship between anomalies and symmetric protected topological phases. Uh, so the aim of my, oops, lectures this week is to um, review various aspects of this relationship and try to shed new lights on old constructions and to tell you at least a bit, a small bit about new uh, developments. So the lectures will be split into four parts as announced and uh, so there are four lectures. In the first lecture, I will uh, remind you about the perturbative anomalies, which are very familiar for high energy physicists, perturbative anomalies for continuous G. And I will explain its relation to quantum hole physics. So that's the content of the first talk. And tomorrow, I will talk about uh, anomalies for finite groups.
But to make the exposition uh, simpler, I will stay in 1 plus 1D mostly for the second lecture. And then in the third lecture, I'm going to perform various generalizations. So, I mean, the first generalization anybody can think of is to generalize 2D to higher dim dimensions, higher space-time dimensions. Also, the discussion in the second lecture will be about pure anomalies and pure uh, flavor anomalies. So you might want to generalize that to mixed anomalies. Anomalies between flavor and the gravitational background. And then you might want to generalize from something called zero form symmetries, which is the ordinary symmetries, to a higher form symmetries. And in the last talk, uh, I will give a brief explanation of the content of that paper I just mentioned. So as an application, I'd like to explain the content of the paper by Gaiotto, Kapustin, uh, Komargotsky, and Zyberg, uh, which is in 2017. I should say that the content of the first lecture is all known in the early 80s. And uh, most of the contents in the second and the third lecture is actually contained in the paper by Digraph and Witten in the 1990. So uh, three quarters of the talk will be, in fact, a review of the very old results. But well, not very old, but at least, well, it's kind of oldish, right? So I'm not sure whether uh, it's OK for me to, uh, I mean, I thought this winter school might be, I mean, was supposed to be about uh, recent developments, right? But, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to give a, a review of these things. But um, there should be at least one uh, new thing in the end. Um, so at least for East Asians, there's a standard way to excuse yourself from this kind of tricky situation. And uh, I, I'm not sure whether this is understandable to the European people, but uh, let me just quote the proverb uh, from Analects of Confucius. Uh, <laughs> it's known as uh, So this is a 2,000-year-old saying by Confucius. Uh, so it's like a Bible for these people, so Analects, Analects 2, column 11. Uh, let me translate it for you. <laughs> so this means warm up. So this just means old, and this means then. This is mean learn. And this means new. So he said that it is not only important just to think about or trying to do something new, completely new, right? Uh, he said it's often good to revisit all the things and try to learn new uh, insights from these things. So uh, that's the uh, <laughs> moral message <laughs> of my talk. and. Uh, <laughs> That's the end of the introduction, and let me get into the uh, main content of the talk. Right. Right. So.
I don't know if this is <laughs> better or not to scrape the water. Maybe I'm making it worse. Right. So let me start with 2D uh, non chiral fermions, uh, complex massless uh, complex fermion. And let's couple it to U1. So it's a very standard system. You put it on S1 times time. And furthermore, uh, let theta to be the integral of the gauge field around the x direction along x1. And uh, everybody knows that because of the gauge uh, equivalence, uh, theta equals 0 and theta equals 2 pi uh, should be the same, right? Or would be the same. But that's not quite true. So that's the uh, main point of the anomaly. So let's see how it arises. Um, so you have the left movers and the right movers. And when theta is 0, uh, if you perform the quantization, there are energy levels for the fermions on both sides. Let's say this is the zero energy point. And in general, uh, let's say the uh, right moving side has the energy level 2 pi n plus theta over L, where L is the circumference of the ray, uh, circle. And let's say on the, this guy has the opposite dependence on theta. And Dirac introduced the concept of the Dirac C so that uh, negative energy levels are all filled, whereas the positive energy levels are unfilled. So this is the setup at theta equals to zero. And let's consider gradually changing theta. So what happens if you gradually change theta? Um, so this side gradually goes up, right? It's hard to draw it in an understandable way. And the left movers instead go down, go down a bit. Right, so, oops, this level is raised by plus theta, while the other level is low lowered by theta. And, but because we are doing this adiabatically, the field levels are the same. But see what happens if you do a complete full circle change from theta equals to zero to theta equals two pi. What happens is that uh, on the left mover side, the levels shift by one, one complete unit. And the uh, field levels were completely shifted by one, while on the right hand side, well, again, the levels are shifted again, but in the opposite order. So, the situation you have this is this. So although the level structure at the start when theta equals zero and at the end theta equals two pi are completely the same, you gained a new excitation. You gained a new excitation here and you lost an excitation there. So if you assign a non chiral charge
then the total charge doesn't change. But if you assign chiral charge assignment such that let's say this is minus one, you assign positive and negative charge to the left movers and the right movers, you gained uh, excess charge by two, right? So this is uh, given by the formula as follows. So you change theta gradually from zero to two pi and uh, you get two. And uh, which can also be written as a two dimensional integral of the curvature integrated over the space time. So this is the standard chiral anomaly. So this is the standard explanation in the textbook. So let's proceed to the case of a single chiral massless complex fermion. Um, so I'm going to do a very bad thing for those of you who are taking notes by <laughs> modifying what's written on the uh, blackboard. Um, so if any of you is, uh, is taking the note with a tablet, you should first copy the entire content you wrote and uh, erase yeah, I'm very sorry right so how should we understand the situation in the chiral case Um, so the situation is kind of worse. There's no non-chiral charge assignment, right? So no charge is universally conserved. But there is a fact that if you do this full circle change of theta from zero to two pi, you get, you get excess charge. Which is one, right? So it is very natural to assign a charge to the intermediate situation as follows. So let's assign, so the charge, U1 charge of the vacuum with this given value of theta, it's itself theta over two pi. We can check that uh, this is indeed the charge, U1 charge of the vacuum by doing the standard uh, 2D CFT computation, which can be found in any CFT textbooks. So uh, I don't uh, review that, but please trust me that this is the U1 charge of the system. Um, but this sounds very strange because here we are talking about uh, genuinely U1 uh, symmetry, not symmetry algebra taken in R. So here we are talking about periodicity of the group elements, which goes from zero to two pi, right? So for the action of the group U1 to be consistent, the charge of a particle or the charge of a state 
needs to be integer. Otherwise, I mean, identity element doesn't act by an identity. But I just said that the U1 trans is in general fractional. It can take an arbitrarily irrational number by choosing theta. So what is going on? Um, so one way to state what is going on is as follows. Uh, let me, no. One way to say that is as follows. So let's say you consider the trace, I mean, you consider the partition function over the entire Hilbert space. But you insert the chemical potential uh, to the U1 charge and also include the standard factor. Um, what you find is that because Q in this sector is equal to theta over 2 pi mod z, um, the partition function, this becomes uh, a bit ambiguous in its phase. But it's not just randomly ambiguous. This ambiguity and be, although I said it's ambiguous, it's controllable. So this controllable ambiguity uh, comes from this fact, right? So what happens is that when you change this chemical potential phi to zero, phi from zero to two pi, capital Z changes by exponential of uh, I theta. So, so remember this theta was the integral of AX DX around this one. So this background uh, U1 controls how, how much Z changes under global gauge transformation. Um, so this fact is known under various names. Uh, let's just remind it. So if U1 is dynamical, well, it's not possible. In order to do a path integral over the U1 gauge field two, um, the partition function should be a gauge invariant function of the gauge field. And this clearly means that it is not. So, so this is a manifestation of the so-called gauge anomaly. Uh, but you can keep U1 symmetry to be flavor symmetry, by which I mean, well, I mean non-dynamical. In this case, um, well, there are various ways to phrase things, but I would say that the system can still couple to flavor U1 flavor symmetry, but the phase is ambiguous in a controllable way, and this is usually known in the literature under the name Tohoft anomaly. But they are basically the same thing. What's controlling the anomaly is the fermion. And whether you call it a gauge anomaly or the Hoft anomaly comes from the fact whether you want to make U1 dynamical or not. So the phenomenon is the same. So let's remind you how this gauge variation is characterized 
in terms of the Charles Simons theory. So this is related to 3D Charles Simons term. Let me first give a very rough argument and then give you a more precise formulation. So roughly, you first consider in three-dimensional spacetime the action of this form, ADA, where A is the gauge field. And let's consider doing the gauge transformation. A goes to A plus D chi. And this will change as M3 D chi DA. And, and this can be partially integrated once in two ways, depending on your choice, right? I'm, I'm intentionally being rough here, so I'm skipping all of the coefficients and signs. So this means that if the three-dimensional manifold doesn't have a, sorry, it, it it's, doesn't have a boundary, then this is gauge invariant. But there, if there's a boundary, this is gauge dependent. But this gauge dependence is exactly the one you found here. So this is because of the following. This is because of the following. Um, ah, I just erased it, unfortunately. But uh, in the computation I just did, we are considering the holonomy around the spatial S1 to be theta and the temporal S1 to be phi, right? And the gauge transformation from phi equals 0 to phi equals 2 pi is done by a gauge transformation of the form d chi, which integrates to 2 pi. So if you use this form of the partial integral, this tells you that the phase of the partition function changes by something proportional to the integral uh, of A around the spatial side. So that's what we found. So let me be more precise. Um, so, in order to be precise, you need to pay a lot of price. I first wrote this expression, but this is uh, wrong in so many ways. Because we are going to, con we, because we want to consider a gauge field with non-trivial flux, you cannot even write it as dA. So that's very bad. So this doesn't make sense. Um, but remember, this is like f wedge f. So this makes sense. So in order to make sense, you realize m3 as a boundary of a four-dimensional space x4, and you try to define this Chan Simons term as an integral of f wedge f over x4, right? 
But st still, this doesn't make much sense because nobody told you which x4 you take. You might want to define this as this, but somebody else sitting beside you might choose a different x4. So which do you want to take? So you, need to, you want to guarantee that these two expressions have the same value. So the way to do that, so you need to compare the difference. What's the difference? Uh, difference is obtained by evaluating uh, this one minus this one, right? So instead, you glue the opposite of x4 prime to the original x4 along m3, and the difference is the integral of f wedge f on this total closed four manifold. Um, now I need to remind you various features. Gauge fields integrated al along various two cycles is an integer. So this is called first churn class. Churn numbers. And another important thing is that if you take the square and integrate over the whole space time, this is an even integer if x is spin. If x is given a spin structure. Uh, so please just ask, trust me about that. Then one half. This is well defined. Well defined integer. This means that oh, this means that uh, if you define the Chern Simons term. So if you define the Chern Simons term as follows, uh, so everything everything in this expression is schematic be, due to the reason I just explained. I need to place scare quotes for the entire expression, but let me define it as exponential. <laughs> By expression on the right hand side makes perfect sense where you have m and x. So we define this expression as that one. Uh, if so when when k is an integer, then the right hand side makes sense. Because if you use different x's, the difference here is an integer. So um, this is the precise definition of the uh, u1 chan Simon's term. And the important thing is that this is an integer. Sorry. k integer. Ah, I, I just wrote it for U1, Sharon Simons, on the spin manifold. Um, with this careful definition, uh, you can redo the rough derivation I just gave you without fixing the coefficient. Again, carefully, and you find that the phase change in the partition function is exactly the one of the phase change of the fermion, complex uh, chiral fermion on the world sheet. So that's the standard fact. And well, this explanation can also be found in many 
high energy physics textbooks. But uh, let me give you a slightly different way of viewing the same thing. So in the last 30 minutes or so, I introduced first the physical system for us, which is the two-dimensional chiral complex fermion. And then I introduced this mathematical object as something which characterizes the phase change of the anomaly, right? That's very mathematical. That's how I felt when I first learned this anomaly descent uh, formalism. Is there anything more physical to this expression, right? And in fact, this is a very well-known condensed matter system. Sorry, do you have a reference for all the story you just uh, talked about? Ah, so the reference, um, well, it can be found in various textbooks, but uh, one thing I can tr recommend you is a TASI lecture by Jeff Harvey, uh, which can be easily found on the archive. So you just type in TASI lecture and Harvey and anomalies, and that will <laughs> give you one. Yuji, yes. Right. But when you glue these two things together, right. it's not clear that it's smooth, right? Ah, yeah, so you need to assume, when you define this, when you try to define this as an extension, you, you assume that you extend A smoothly to X. No, no, but you glue these two things together and say the difference would be an integer. Right. But so they may not approach geometry in the same way. Maybe they can. I think in order to be very precise, you need to assume that the... Um, a of the four-dimensional space reduced to, I mean, restricted to the tubular neighborhood of M, you need to say that it's very, I mean, it doesn't have, yeah, tangential, sorry, transversal component, yeah, so that the, it glues correctly. So the important point is that this, this 3D action, this is the low energy effective action of integer quantum whole material. So that's the important insight. Well, condensed matter physicists knew for a long time, but is now being reappreciated <laughs> in our field. Ah, again, and on this matter, there's a very nice lecture note for high energy physicists by David Tong, which can be found in his web page. So I highly recommend his lecture note. Um, so let me remind you what is this integer quantum hole effect to high, in a high energy physics language. So condensed matter physics, physicist starts from a, some experimental uh, slab of silicon, very pure silicon, and put huge amount of magnetic field perpendicular to the slab, and so what happens is that electron moves on the surface of this material, right, under the influence of the magnetic field. What they find is that, um, and they put a certain voltage across the sample, and funnily, it's known that the current runs perpendicular to the voltage. So the ratio of the current and the voltage is known as the whole conductivity, and it has this form in the physical unit, where this is an integer. This whole conductivity. And 
this fact can be derived very easily if you start from this effective action. So let me first uh, emphasize that here, the U1 field of the uh, quantum hole material is not dynamical. So in the high energy physics literature, we often talk about U1 Chan Simons theory, or SU2 Chan Simons theory, when, where we always pass integrate over the gauge field. But here, this is classical, right? But still, effective action is of this form, K times ADA, right? So from this expression, you can compute the two-point function of the U1 current R. And also, this U1 current, U1 gauge field is the photon field we are just seeing, right? You are using this photon to see the blackboard. And, uh, but in order to com com compute the two-point function, you take the variational derivative of, I mean, this effective action. The important point is that because this is written using terms of just differential forms, this involves epsilon tensor 0, 1, 2. And then in condensed matter physics, there's a standard machinery converting two-point function into uh, these conductivities using Kubo formula. It is not unreasonable that such a formula exists, right? In any case, this relation means that you apply a voltage, which is an excitation by a photon, and you get the current, which is again an electric response. So you consider this as, a, as by hitting the sample with a photon, and then you want to get the response. So there's a formula, and it gives you a conductivity. And from this very rough description, you clearly see that the final effect is proportional to k, which is the coefficient here, that involves this uh, epsilon tensor. So this describes exactly this kind of effect where you have something strange in involving this epsilon tensor, which is proportional to an integer. So the fact that the co quantum hole conductivity is integral um, reflects the fact that this effective action is only consistent when k is an integer. So I have still 10 minutes. At this point, you might ask, aha, but uh, what you just told us is totally wrong, right? Um, some of you might have heard that there's a material which is more exotic than integer quantum hole effect called fractional quantum hole effect, right? There, uh, this whole conductivity K takes a fractional, rational value. How this can be consistent with the very general argument I just gave, right? The point is the following. I haven't explained an important fact about this 3D quantum, uh, integer quantum hole effect material. Which is that it only has single uh, low energy state, single vacuum state in a closed spatial slice. So, you see, although we, no experimenter can do quantum hole effect experiment, 
in a closed three manifold times the time, right? You can still think of considering a closed three manifold as a spatial slice of some universe, right? Filled with silicon times the time, right? And let's go to the low energy limit. Um, so what happens is that um, so what happens is that under under the presence of the magnetic field, there's I mean electrons move ar around the magnetic flux and they form something called Landau levels. And if you consider weakly interacting systems, electrons just fill those levels. And suppose the Fermi energy is um, between the levels, so that, I mean, these two levels are filled. Because this system is, if you consider, I mean, non-interacting fermions, like this, this is very simple. The low energy, the lowest energy state is unique in a fixed geometry. So you fill every level there, and also, I mean, in order to excite electron from a field level to a field level, uh, it takes finite energy to excite things. So let's try to go to an extreme IR limit in the high energy physics sense, below this energy gap, right? Below this energy gap. What happens? You just see one state in the system. That's a very unusual feature for high energy physicists to assign to a quantum field theory, right? Usually, when we first learn about quantum field theories, we are told that in order to make quantum mechanics consistent with special relativity, I mean, always there's a creation of particle and antiparticles, so you are automatically forced to consider infinite dimensional Hilbert space, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this is a quantum field theory where a Hilbert space on a, I mean, well, closed three manifold is really just one dimensional. There's not, I mean, it's even simpler than the standard quantum mechanical system where you have infinite number of states, right? Even a one particle moving on a line or circle has infinite number of states. But here you really have just one state in the system. Um, so, therefore, because of this, effective action, I mean, partition function, is just a phase. Takes values in U1. So this is the defining feature. Uh, of integer quantum hole effect. And, and then,
you try to write such a thing in terms of a functional of A, right? But the local functional of A has various terms like ADA plus, uh, I mean, F squared, dot, dot, dot. But as usual in the analysis of the IR limit, the most dominant term is the term with the least number of derivatives. So this wins in the extreme IR limit. So everything else drops out. And then you just redo the analysis I just gave you to conclude that the coefficient in front of it is an integer. So the crucial input which makes this k integer is the fact that there's just one state in the system on a, on a closed manifold so that the partition function is just a phase. Um, there can be a more complicated interacting systems which is still gapped. There can, but there can be multiple number of states, lowest states. In, if this is the case, you cannot say that this is just u1 and the logarithm is just a number, and then the analysis uh, I gave you doesn't go through, and this might, this, this, such systems corresponds to, uh, frac such systems can describe fractional uh, quantum hole materials. So let me conclude the first lecture by summarizing. Uh, Ah, but before summarizing, I need to say one thing, more, one more thing about quantum hole material. So I said that uh, in the 2 plus 1D bulk, this integer quantum hole thing which is described by KADA is very trivial, right? I mean, it just gives you a number. There's a, only one state. But suppose if you have a boundary, but if you have a boundary, boundary, this is not gauge invariant. as I said, right? So if you have such a material in, the, in nature, you might naively think that it's kind of inconsistent because here A is the U1 of the Maxwell field. You need gauge invariance. How can this be consistent in a real setup? So what happens is that even in the condensed matter systems, at the boundary of this 3D material, you have something called chiral edge current, which is a charged U1 complex fermion in high energy physics terminology, whose anomaly exactly cancels the gauge variation of the quantum hole material so that the entire thing is gauge invariant. So, so let me summarize. So, in today's lecture, I started from the anomaly of 1 plus 1D system of, I mean, chiral complex fermion. 
And this was, this has been traditionally what high energy physicists cared in the analysis. And mathematically, even in high energy physics side, this is characterized by the Chern Simons term. ADA, right? But condensed metaphysics physicists think, consider this as a physical system. This is also a physical system. Physical. And once you take that point of view, the relationship between this and that is that the entire physical, for the entire physical system to be consistent and gauge invariant on the boundary of this rather trivial bulk system, you need to have a system, lower dimensional system, with an anomaly. So recent years in condensed matter physics, such a system is called a sy symmetry protected topological phases and in this case this symmetry is g equals u1 so let me just give you the translation of this condensed matter language to high energy physics language so this just means a qft with flavor symmetry g such that uh, the Hilbert space is one dimensional. On a compact space, compact spatial slice. So, for high energy physicists, I think such a QFT was a bit unfamiliar because I mean it's almost the most trivial QFT you can think of. It has the least amount of dyna dynamical degrees of freedom, which is, I mean, one. <laughs> you cannot be simpler than that. But still, it has lots of interesting physics going on. Because if you try to cut it open, something new pops up. So that's the important info. And in fact, you can, think, you can even think of the M-theory itself as something similar in it. Because in the 11-dimensional bulk, uh, it's very simple. Well, it's very complicated, but at the low energy level, it just consists of 11-dimensional supergravity and nothing more. But if you try to cut it, as Hojava and Witten showed, um, you are forced to introduce some very complicated material, which is the E8 gauge multiplet, and that's how heteriotic strings is lifted to M theory. So in that language, um, this part, so in, in some sense, you can think of also the M theory 11 dimensional space time as kind of a topological material. And so today's message is that you can think of this side as also physical. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuji, for this very inspiring lecture. Questions, please. So we'll ask questions in the discussion session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. much.